On behalf of the Basin Council, I'd like to thank our gold sponsor, um, Clackamas Water Environment Services. Um, Clackamas Water Environment Services produces clean water and protects water quality for more than 190,000 people living and working in Clackamas County. They provide innovative water resource recovery services, stormwater management, and environmental education, and so much more. Um, they are an excellent resource to the community as well. Um, we'd also like to thank our brown sponsors, Clackamas River Water Providers, um, and the Geological Society of the Oregon Country, who is sponsoring this evening's program. So the Geological Society of the Oregon Country, or GSOC, was organized in 1935. This society promotes the study of the geology of the Pacific Northwest and is open to persons with all levels of education and professional backgrounds. Um, their monthly lectures are currently held virtually and are open to everyone. Um, when they resume in person, those lectures are held at Portland State University monthly. Um, they also offer in-depth field trips to their members led by professional geologists and the field trips are really awesome. So I highly encourage people to, to join GSOC's events. Um, for more information, uh, you can visit gsoc.org and you can follow them on Twitter and Facebook. And I'd also like to thank the many um, individuals who have donated to support the conference. Um, it's free to everyone. And so in order to do that, we, we do need donations. So there's information on our website if you're interested in sponsoring the, the seminar series. Of course, it's always appreciated and donations are tax deductible. And also, um, CRBC is partnering with the Environmental Learning Center at Clackamas Community College. Um, attendees of this workshop will receive continuing education units um, and can also request a signed certificate of completion for each session. So if you'd like a signed certificate of completion, um, add your contact, contact information to our Journey Down the Clackamas Confer Conference Networking Google Sheet. Um, and indicate you'd like a certificate in the G column. And that uh, Google Sheet, Adam just posted in the chat, and I think it's also available on our website. Um, we'll forward your contact information to Clackamas Community College to get those CEUs um, administered. Um, to start off, I'd like to start with the land recognition. The Clackamas Basin and the lands from which we join this meeting have been occupied by Native peoples since time immemorial. The Clackamas Basin is originally the territory of the Clackamas, Chinook, Malala, Kalapuya, and other peoples, and is currently recognized as lands of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, and also belongs to other Native peoples who may not be federally recognized. We thank those who came before us for their stewardship of these lands and waters and those who continue to steward them now and in the future. Um, so we are gathered for this journey down the Clackamas Conference to learn in-depth information about the basin, to connect so that we can help support each other in our collective work to protect and improve the river and to share our passion for this amazing watershed that many of us call home or recreate in. Um, so just a couple of ground rules before we get started um, and before I introduce our speaker. So I think everyone's pretty well versed in this by now. Um, while the presentation is going on, please keep your microphones on mute um, unless invited to participate. And please keep your cameras off. Um, that will help us save bandwidth for our presenters. And it, um, it also has the added benefit of reducing the carbon footprint of the meeting. <laughs> Um, the camera and microphone controls are in the bottom left of your screen. Um, and if you're calling in, pound six will mute and unmute. Um, and this program is being recorded, just so everyone knows that. As the presentation goes on, um, we're not going to ask presentation or questions mid-presentation, but ask um, people to either ask their question in the chat box, and Susie and Adam will be monitoring that. Um, 
you can also just type in the chat box, I have a question, and we can know to call on you at the end of the presentation if you'd rather um, unmute and ask it um, yourself instead of typing it. Um, and then also we could do a hand raise um, at the end if people know where the reaction buttons are to raise your hand and ask a question. So, <laughs> Finally, um, our presenter tonight is Katie Chambers. Uh, she is a Western Oregon resource soil scientist with the Natural Resource Conservation Service in Salem. Uh, she provides regional technical guidance for natural resource management, farm bill compliance, and is an educational resource for soil information in Western Oregon. Um, prior to her current position in Salem, she worked as an NRCS soil scientist in the Klamath Falls Soil Survey Office. Um, in addition, she has worked with the U.S. Forest Service and a private strawberry nursery. Uh, she received her master's in soil science from North Dakota State University in Fargo and a B.S. in biology and chemistry from Bemidji State University in Bemidji, Minnesota. Uh, one of her favorite endeavors is talking about soils and educating others about the world beneath our feet. So that's perfect. <laughs> so let's welcome Katie to present about soils of the Clackamas River. Thank you, Katie. And I think you are able to share your screen. Yeah, I'm sharing now. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me to talk about soils. I've been watching uh, these series and it's been very informative and I've enjoyed them very much. So I feel very honored to be able to be part of uh, this um, conference. I um, have prepared a presentation for you and I hope you enjoy it. I've enjoyed learning about the soils. Um, as Liz had mentioned, I am not originally from this area. So I have um, been in, engulfed in learning about the soils within the Clackamas River for the last um, few weeks. <laughs> um, hopefully you enjoy what I have to say. Um, So I would like to start with just a really short introduction of what soil is. If uh, you take anything from this presentation, please remember this, that soil is alive. It is a complex ecosystem that is composed of both living and organic material, or, or living and, and non-living matter. Uh, soil is, there is no uh, life without soil, and also there is no soil without life. Part of the reason why I've uh, ventured into this career is because it involves so many different sciences. It, it incorporates the atmosphere, the lithosphere, the biosphere, and the hydrosphere. And these intersect to create help with the formation of different soils. Soils are composed of um, part, uh, solid particles as well as uh, water and air. They are a three-phase system. Half of the soils are, half of soils are composed of um, particles that 5% is organic matter. The other half is split with 25% water and air is that an ideal um, amount of air to water ratio for soils. Soils is also the skin of the earth. Here is a diagram of a colleague of mine explaining or demonstrating that soils are the thin layer of the earth. And just like how skin protects us and provides services, so do soils. There are five functions of soils. Plant production, which provides us with food, as well as um, um, forests and places to recreate. It also sequesters carbon within um, 
uh, profile and helps control climate. It filters and water, it filters our and buffers our water. So we have clean water to drink. It also provides habitat and biologic habitat for biological activity. And it also cycles matter and is part of the major portion of the nutrient cycle within the planet. The sources that I have been um, investigating in these last few weeks is um, the Na National Cooperative Soil Survey Manuals of Marion County, Clackamas County, the uh, Warm Springs Indian Reservation, and also the State Soil Geographic Database, which is uh, acronym is STATSCO. It is basically the general soils map and is continuous throughout uh, Oregon. I also looked at the Forest Service publication, Soil Resource Inventory. I would like to mention that the soil resource inventory is a completely different product comparatively to the soil surveys of the counties, but it is very useful in its aspect. And I would also like to mention when the Forest Service, when the soil scientists on, on the forests were um, given permission to, or um, not given permission, but like uh, um, given this task of mapping the soils within their forest. They only had six months to do it. And the surveys are directly comparable to how well those scientists understood the soils there. The uh, National Cooperative Soil Surveys for each county can take up to decades to complete. And it has a, a great detail of information that um, is actually quite fun to explore, in my opinion. But I am a soil scientist, so. Um, the data that soil surveys um, are created from is at the root of, is, is a pet on data, is at the root of the data. Um, and after that, it's um, extrapolated. Here is an image that I just wanted to introduce um, that every pedon that uh, is classified also has um, lab data. And there is thousands of pedons with lab data out in, um, throughout the United States. And all this information is public knowledge. Now I will start talking about the, Klamath, the Clackamas River Basin. Uh, this is just a, an image that was that I made to show you where the Clackamas River Basin is, but I'm sure you already know. <laughs> um, I just want to briefly expose you to soil taxonomy. There's, I'm going to be using the words order and series, and I just wanted to give you a basis of what that really means. Um, the order is uh, the basic uh, soil taxonomy and is um, the, the basic level of soil taxonomy and it represents the major differences of soil forming processes. The series is just a common name that is usually named after a geographic location and is simply used for more of a communication because saying fine mixed active mesic Derek, paleo um, humates or humults is not exactly rolls off your tongue. So we use the name a new an easier name to be able to discuss soils with other um, professionals and the public. There are six dominant soil orders within the Clackamas River Basin. The Jory soil, which is a state soil, is uh, an example of an alpasol. Um, I'll go back to explain that, but I'll start with um, the inceptosols. Inceptosols are basically the initial stages, or not the initial stages, but a little bit further development than an entosol, but are fairly young development within the soil um, 
borders. Also, there's andesalt, which is primarily volcanic material developed from, but there are other ways that um, andesalt can develop with other than just um, volcanic um, ash deposits. With, there is also alpha salts, and alpha salts are typically found in semi-arid to humid regions and are found under hardwood forests. They have um, a mild acidity and, some, and clay accumulation within the subsoil. And mollusols are found more on grassland areas and prairies and have a deep, dark surface from the accumulation of organic material. The reason why there's a, there's a deep, dark um, surface is because annual dieback of roots within um, the grasses and that material gets incorporated in. And alpha sols are the highly weathered soils and tend to be very acidic. Uh, they are a pretty older, well-developed soil. Um, and they also have, they're usually quite a bit of clay accumulation and they occur in warm and humid climates. And spodosols, which are some of the most beautiful soil <laughs> that you'll ever see, in my opinion, I guess. Um, but I mean, every soil is beautiful, but spodosols tend to be a little bit more picturesque with their um, E horizons or their alluviate uh, horizon. And they form different colors below that horizon. Um, and they're found in moist climates, the never kind of uh, conifer forests. And the colors that um, leach through the profile are organic material, iron, and uh, you also can have clay and alluvium, alum, aluminum oxides. Here is a map depicting where the locations of the dominant soil orders are. Along the low elevations along the river, you, there's where most of the mollusols are, and as well as the alpha cells. As you go further um, up elevation, you have a lot of the alpha cells. Um, and alpha cell, the alpha cells in this area are primarily formed from basalt and um, high uh, um, moment of weathering. Then as you go up the drainage, you have inceptosols as well as andosols at the higher elevations. And at the highest elevations, you have spodosols. Soils are formed from the five soil forming factors. The soil forming factors determine um, the location and the kinds of soils. Currently, there's 23,000 soil series in um, various combinations of different slopes and different surfaces and uh, topography within the United States. The five soil forming factors are relief, parent material, organism, time, and climate. And I've designed the presentation to around these five soil forming factors, but I'm trying to tie them into specific soils that I ha um, have, that you can see in the landscape. First, I'll start with climate. So climate is a seasonal pattern of precipitation as well as temperature over a long period of time. So it's not that it's just raining today or raining tomorrow, it's that it's been raining for 30 years or more, or um, vice versa, or with the temperature as well. Um, there are important influences on the chemical, physical, and biological processes that are responsible for developing soils. As an example, weathering rates of parent material can weather and expose more nutrients from the, the rock um, that it forms from. Uh, the type of abundance of 
organisms and also the soil fertility. There are four main types of climates within the Clackamas River Basin. You have warm, dry summers and cool, moist winters towards the lower elevations. And as you move up elevation, the temperatures drop, they get cooler. And at the very highest elevation, you have cool, moist summers and cold, moist winters. In the highest elevation, it's very common for uh, snow pack to remain into midsummer. Those climate impacts cause different communities to exist within the topography of the basin or of the landscape. The highest elevations is the Mount, mountain hemlock zone. And um, tend to be less soil development because of the cool, how cold it is. It has lots of moisture, but it's cold that where biological activity doesn't, um, isn't as prolific as it when you go down slope. The different weathering um, products that are produced or the weathering uh, rates that are produced due to the amount of precipitation or temperature within the system um, detect, dec, uh, detect um, controls <laughs> the rate of weathering and the soil development within the parent material. As you go down slope, you'll have more weathering and more soil development um, because of more moisture and more heat. Also, the growing season increases um, length as you go down slope. So there's more organic material being produced as well as more organic material being broken down and incorporated within the soil soils, uh, um, profile. Organic material is very important within the soil system because it can provide um, a lot of a cation exchange capacity, which is the way I like to think of it as uh, your, your bank account for nutrients. It's an exchange system of um, important nutrients that plants utilize for production or growth. Um, so the depth of organic matter increases as your plant production increases. And as the temperature and the moisture interact, the more that organic matter is decomposed and incorporated deeper into the soil profile. Here is an example of two different soils. I did not have um, a picture from Mount Hood National Forest of Asbodosol, but this is the closest, <laughs> the best closest I could find. This was, is an unnamed soil that was um, described in the Willamette National Forest. It is a spodosol. And uh, the way that the spodosol has formed is that there's a lot of organic material on top of the soil of the duff layer. And as it decomposes, it, the organic material mixes with the soil, but also there's a high amount of water that infiltrates and precipitation that infiltrates and moves that material further down the profile. These soils tend to be a lot more sandy versus silty um, and water infiltration is quicker. If you look closer to close to the top of the horizon, you will see a little bit of a gray color. This is a zone of alluviation. So the organic material, the iron and aluminum oxides, as well as clay, move through that profile or through that soil and accumulate down below. Comparatively, there is an alpha sol, the Salm soil series, which is formed under dug fir and uh, Oregon white oak, as well as the ground cover of grasses. You can see how much 
organic material has accumulated deeper within the profile by how dark it is. So darkness indicates that there's a higher amount of organic material comparatively down below. Now parent material is basically the initial state in which the soil system has begun um, forming. It's the unconsolidated material which soils develop from. It plays a key role in physical and chemical properties as well as what nutrients are available with the mineral composition. And also it affects how, permeabil how permeability and drainage it is. If a sandier soil develops from um, a soil or from a parent material comparatively to a clay, the drainage is going to be stronger um, or is going to be higher through uh, a sandy material than comparatively to a clay soil. It also impacts the structure and the erosion potential. Silt um, is quite known to be able to be blown um, for multiple distances and has a higher erosion potential than say a soil that has formed from um, sandy alluvium or sandy uh, material deposited from uh, a, a river system. So texture is a, a major um, factor that plays a role from uh, parent material and as well as color. So I just wanted to talk about a little bit for about a uh, texture. So we determine how much or what a texture is of a soil by the quantity of sand versus clay versus silt. And we use the, the um, soil triangle to depict that. The, the best type of soil that you have, is, that you could have is loam. Reason why it has equal, it has equal properties of sand, silt, and clay, but it also has and that that those properties allow more water infiltration and plant available and water available to plants, as well as the interaction of uh, nutrients and nutrient cycling. It is considered the sweet spot. The other two images on the opposite sides, the left and the right are depicting how you can tell what kind of texture you have. The jar, you could go out to your garden or anywhere that you want to collect some soil, put it in the jar and shake it up. And as it settles, you can tell how much sand versus clay versus silt is. And you can texture it by creating a ribbon. The length of the ribbon is corresponds to how much clay is within your soil. This is just an image that has um, helps you visualize the proportions of what sand, silt, and clay are. If sand was a big beach ball, then silt would be about the size of a basketball. And if silt is the size of a basketball, then the clay size would be about the size of a dime. The sizes of uh, grain size depicts how or controls how big your pore spaces are. If you have bigger grains, such as the sand, you're going to have bigger pore spaces comparatively to clay, where you'll have smaller pore spaces. And it takes longer time for water to infiltrate through those smaller pore spaces, but it also takes a longer time for or more of uh, pressure for evaporation. So it can hold on to the moisture a lot better. This is a dot block diagram that I drew because I was having a really hard time sorting through all these soils. And this is the way I think, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm more of a visual learner. So this is, I designed the block diagram to represent the majority of the parent materials that are within Clack Clackamas River Basin, as well as the topography and where the soils lie on that topography. The red box 
um, is the proximate location that I gathered to create the block diagram. I must inform you that this is not drawn to scale by any means. It's just a visual aid. But I drew or I called out Barton so you could have a little bit more of a visual idea of where approximately this block diagram exists. The blue line is the Clackamas River path. The black lines are the 400 foot contour lines, which below that could have been affected by the outburst floods of, Mount, or of uh, Missoula floods. Above that line has not been impacted by that um, event or events. The parent materials of these soils I have um, depicted on the block diagram are jewelry mostly forms from residuum and colluvium. And that is one of the older soils that's one of the alta salts. It has a strong clay um, uh, soil because of what it's weathering from, which is the salt. The Somme soil is also weathering from the salt, but more of colluvium, which I will um, be <laughs> explaining a little bit further about which or which. But colluvium basically is the um, landslides and debris flows and um, material that's uh, pushed downhill by gravity. And alo aloha soil, which is um, a little bit more of a wet soil comparatively to woodburn soil, but that's because it has a, a perched water table, which means that there is a restrictive layer where the water can't get through, but so sits there and then it will cause um, uh, the, the soil to be more saturated where if it didn't have that restrictive layer, the water could go through like it does with the wood burn. The Newburgh soil is a pretty sandy soil because it is part of natural levees. And a lot of the natural levees tend to be more of a coarse material or sandier material. And the Salem soil is, um, got, it's, it's a more coarse, soil as well, but it also has river rock um, incorporated with it. So the parrot materials, alluvium and old alluvium that I've used on my block diagram, um, it basically is just the flowing, the de deposits from flowing streams and rivers. The old alluvium is alluvium, but it's high enough above that 400, um, foot elevation that the Missoula floods did not uh, impact. When I got this opportunity to learn about all these soils within the Clackamas River Basin, I was reading through the manuals and it gets a little complicated to try to visualize without actually being in the location. So my little dog and I <laughs> went and drove around and I love looking at road cuts. It's one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> so I went and I found some road cuts within the area, um, a few of them. And this is the best one that I picture I had. But this soil is um, found on the road coming up from the river within Bonnie Lure State Recreation Area. The image to the left is depicting from Google Earth or Google Maps, the location that I took the picture of. Uh, this, this, map, this soil was actually mapped as Salem. And uh, as you can see that there isn't a, you can, you can see that the soil would have been very, uh, um, it's kept its characteristics of that alluvial material. The Newberg soil uh, is, um, I'll just go back at this. The Newburgh soil is found within the, the levee, the natural levee, 
and tends to be a little more sandy um, and does not have as many rocks. Colluvium, so colluvium is basically the unconsolidated and unsorted material that is transferred downhill and it accumulates the bases of hill slopes and it is um, controlled by gravity. The image of the profile road cut, basically I um, found that on the internet. So it's not actually from here, but it very much could be when you compare the two soils. Um, they look very similar, but they're, I don't really even, I think this, this image came from um, Michigan actually, <laughs> but you can see how there is still some rocks within the SOM soil that has um, developed from this colluvium. And um, yeah. So glacial lacustrian deposits are the material that was deposited after the Missoula flood events, after Lake Ellison dissipated and drained away, um, formed this material that blanketed the, the, the Willamette Valley. And after that, the, the rivers have incised within that material and washed it away. And, but then there's places that it still exists. The Woodburn series is um, on one of those places uh, that has formed from the deposits of the glacial lacustrine material, as well as the Aloha. Residuum uh, is the material that is um, left in place. The Jory soil has formed from, is a very old soil that has formed on um, rolling hills and um, high terraces that uh, the parent material has been um, basalt. And as it's weathered over time, it has developed into a soil. And the Jory soil isn't exactly the most fertile because of how old it is. A lot of those um, nutrients have um, drained away or leached out and um, clay accumulation has occurred and it's a pretty strong or high amount of clay. The map to the top right is showing where the Jory soil has um, been mapped out and where it occurs. And this is the typical landscape that you'll see the Jory soil. So they're at the highest elevation and the oldest parent material within the Willamette Valley. So I use the soil resource inventory data to determine where the four major types of parent material are. Um, but it's, you know, like, like I said, it wasn't as, it's not as detailed as a soil survey, but it fits the purpose of what I was looking at. Um, you'll see like where the pyroclastic flow material or pyroclastic material is versus where the till, um, glacial till is and the igneous. And there's also miscellaneous areas where these could be bare ground to um, uh, pits and um, others uh, that didn't fit into these categories of pyroclastic, igneous, and till. So pyroclastic material is the, the deposition or the material that comes from the explosion of um, aerial of uh, volcanic vents. The image with the soil, that is, I couldn't find a, an ash picture for Mount Hood National Forest, but this is from um, the uh, Nez Perce Clearwater National Forest in Idaho. And it um, is showing the ash deposit of, um, here is the, the Mount St. Helens deposit versus the Mount um, Nizama deposit. These parent material tend to 
um, be low in nutrients, but high in uh, water holding capacity. And the reason why is if this is um, a sand grain of an ash particle. So as you can see, it's kind of like Swiss cheese. So when the water infiltrates, it can, all those little pores within the, the grain can also fill up with water. Where other soils, if it was say granite or basalt, it's not gonna be porous like that. So it's not going to absorb as much water. Another parent material found in Mount Hood is glacial till. Uh, this is unsorted uh, material. So now this is gonna be a mixture of anything from clay to silt, sand, um, cobbles and stones and bigger chunks. So it's not really as well sorted. This is an image of a soil that has formed glacial till, also not from this area, but you know, it's nice to see soil profiles, even if it's not from here. <laughs> Organisms are another uh, soil forming factor. They play a critical role in um, nutrient cycling, as well as organic matter accumulation. <laughs> uh, soil scientists, at least most soil scientists I know, love seeing a crotavina. What a crotavina is, is a, an animal burrow that has um, been filled in. This image here is showing the edges of where the soil actually was formed versus the crotavina where the animal had burrowed in. And then because of erosional situations, it has filled in. Uh, part of the nutrient cycling that critters can help with is that they carry debris to make their nests. And they also produce organic material and that can come incorporated within the soil profile. And as I had said before, the organic matter is a huge um, player in nutrient cycling and water holding capacity, which that's what plants need. And that's what we really want in a soil. So another comparison is to the wood burn soil versus the clickitat soil. The wood burn soil are formed under dug fir and white oak and also different sorts of, of uh, grasses and has been, organic material has been incorporated in with those roots. The clickitat soil is an inceptisol that has most of the organic material on the surface and has not incorporated as much material within the profile. And as, um, and these are found within the, the clickitat soil is found underneath Western hemlock type uh, forest and have um, more accumulation of organic material on the surface versus incorporated in. It's cooler, it has pretty good moisture, but it's, it's a cooler, less of a growing season. So the organic material does not um, become incorporated as much. Organisms also excrete, or plants also excrete um, exudates which act like glue to keep the soil in an aggregate. And as aggregates continue to grow and create structure within the soil, it also provides pathways for water accumulation to get further down in the profile and within the subsoil um, location. The subsoil <clears throat> can provide a, a reservoir of water to the plants that are growing in that area. You know, during the summertime within the lower portion of the Clackamas River Basin, it goes through a drought system. Well, how do they survive? How do plants survive that? Well, it's the subsoil that 
has a lot of the moisture. And part of being able to store moisture further down is having really good structure. So having more organic material, having more plants to help create that structure um, really assists with water infiltration. Another way that organisms can help uh, form soils is this is a, an example from uh, Mount Mazama um, pumice soil. It's, it's uh, from Klamath Basin area. Um, but I really liked the picture to depict of how much mycorrhizal hyphae can help create and solidify that soil or not solidify, but um, aggregate that soil. They can, this white material, all of this, so that if this, if the microhorizal roots and hyphae, or I mean that the, not the roots, but the, the hyphae weren't there, the soil would just fall apart. There's very basically not, no structure with there, but because of that microhorizal interaction has created some structure. It's not falling apart in my hand. So, it's able to help keep the moisture in. And these forests are where I found this one is a pretty, it's a very dry area. And there isn't a lot of moisture that, that falls there um, comparatively to the Willamette Valley at least. There was something else I wanted to talk about here. I'm sorry, but I, I forgot. <laughs> um, so relief or topography is also another soil forming factor that um, impacts the formation of soils. So where the soil is located within that landscape can um, greatly um, impact the depth of the soil, how much water it can actually infiltrate into how stable the soil is. Um, steeper slopes will tend to have more of a moving system where you're having more material being um, deposited. Um, so at the tops of hills, you'll have more soil development comparatively to side slopes that are very steep. And then you'll also have deeper soils when you get down to valley bottoms. And a lot of that mineral and organic material gets washed down and accumulates the valley bottom. This is an example from Mount Hood National Forest that I found from just looking around the LIDAR to explain my point of steep slopes versus more of a stable slope. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you see with the edges right in this area, um, you can see how steep that area is. Well, the soil isn't going to form as quickly because when it starts to form, it may lose um, stability and fall downhill. And you'll have more accumulation of soil or more accumulation of material down at more um, downslope positions and along the river. These hills here are a little bit more stable comparatively to right here. Another uh, aspect or another um, um, soil or the aspect, I'll just, the other aspect, the aspect of your hill slope will also have an impact on what soils develop and what vegetation communities you have. North slopes tend to have a little bit cooler average temperature. So the plant communities will um, adapt to that. You know, while I was mapping in um, Klamath River or Klamath Basin area, it was, you look for the vegetation to tell you what kind of soils are underneath there. And a lot of times you would find a different soil if your, your community was completely different, or plant community.
another comparison of jewelry and psalm. Uh, so as I had mentioned that the jewelry soil is um, from residuum and colluvium, but primarily with this example, it's from residuum. residuum. <clears throat> the psalm soil is mostly from colluvium. And you can see like the soil development is completely different because of the landscape position. And also another thing I think I might have forgot to point out um, is that as water roll, moves downhill slope, you're going to have more of a impact of flood and the flooding events will be more of an impact as well that play in a part of forming these soils comparatively to the soils that you'd find up on top of hills. The relief and topography of my block diagram are as depicted as going from um, high terraces and rolling hills to the glacial lacustrine deposits having being terraces above uh, the floodplain. The soils of Newburgh and um, MACB are within the new, um, or not new, but um, the existing alluvium and the existing impact of the river uh, comparatively as you move to uh, the old alluvium, which has not had an so that has not been impacted by the Missoula floods. Your soil development is going to be different on that the topography, primarily because of the time. So the next soil forming factor is time. As climates and organisms interact with the topography as well as the parent material, it changes and develops over time. The development of soils is dependent pretty uh, intensely to weathering events, which is uh, the climate. So the more intense weathering that you'll have, uh, the faster your soil is going to form. Comparatively, if you compare the soil zone at the lower portion of the Clackamas River Basin to the highest elevation of the Clackamas River Basin, you, you will have different rates of weathering and soil development. Again, this is just an, an image to um, help you see where the block diagram exists. So I have these soils um, arranged so that, um, or I've picked these soils because they are a sequence in time of soils. They're not the same parent material, but they do um, depict a time sequence. So the oldest material is of the uh, basalt that the jewelry, had, jewelry soil has formed from and has had a lot of interaction with the time or within climate and organisms and is, is fully developed soil and has lost a lot of its nutrients due to uh, how much infiltration of water it has um, uh, been impacted by. The terraces of the Missoula flood deposits have a little bit more of a, um, a darker surface that has accumulated because it had more time to develop comparatively to the young soils of the alluvium that is most, um, that occurs with annual flooding. And as, um, more stable slopes develop, the longer the soil stays in place, the more the soil development will uh, occur. So why are the soils so fertile here? You know, I looked at the different types of parent material, um, the different types of soils, and primarily the, the, the reason why these soils are fertile is because of the location and the climate that these soils have experienced. It's a really uh, comfortable weather here 
comparatively, because <laughs> you know, originally I'm from Minnesota. So this is a very mild climate um, and it has a long growing season. So more organic material can be incorporated within the soil because there's more production. And also the Missoula floods provided us with a gift of this perfect um, size fraction of soil that will help with fertility as well as infiltration of water. Is there any questions? This is my dog Bud that he came with me on my little road trip to go check out the Clackamas River. Um, and I thank you for my for your time. Thank you, Katie. That was awesome. Thanks. <laughs> um, right on time, too. Ah. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can um, type them in in the chat. Um, I have one very softball question that I actually don't know the answer to. <laughs> um, <laughs> what makes a soil a state soil? You mentioned that the jury oh. was a state soil. Well, so that is um, each state has a soil and, ha and then um, people actually vote on what soil it is. And this particular instance has a, a bit of a history. Uh, if anybody knows who Scott Burns is, um, okay. So he was one of the, the driving um, people behind getting the Jory soil to become the Jory soil or the state soil. And um, I believe it was that they, they, got, they got called. So there's a bill that gets passed that this is going to be just like how you have a state bird or a state flower, you have a state soil. So the same process occurs. So there's a bill that needs to be passed from the state to accept that soil to be the state soil. And as far as I remember <laughs> the story goes, is that they voted it to be the dumbest bill in Oregon during the time. <laughs> and um, they, they tried getting it passed and tried getting it passed. And I, I, it, I think it was the Oregon State, or Oregon um, OSSS, Oregon Soil Science Society president at the time, uh, his wife made some tie-dyed shirts from the Jory soil because you see how red it is, it can really actually dye fabric. And their kids kind of helped get that, that bill passed. And another key factor is that the basalts from that form, that the Jory soil formed from, came from Eastern Oregon. So it's uniting the East of Oregon and Western Oregon through soil science. Fabulous. <laughs> uh, Katie, I have a question um, from Michael. Are okay. some of the soils you mentioned more prone to aiding in wetland formation and why? Um, well, if, you know, like the Maccabee soil would be more prone to wetland formation. Um, let me go back here. Because this, this is a more, the Maccabee are more in depressional areas, but the water table needs to come up high enough to form um, that type of vegetation, the hydrophytic vegetation. Uh, let's see, what other soil would be? It's all dependent on how high the water is that will make a wetland soil. That hopefully that answers your question. Great. I think you were so thorough. I don't see any additional questions here in the question <laughs> bar. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh. oh, there is one that just popped up. I'm sorry, just in time from David Bugney. <laughs> 
Um, do you have a good reference you can recommend for further reading about the base, uh, the basics of soils, basically oh. to further expand on tonight? Okay. Um, well, I have textbooks I can recommend. Um, other than, um, you know, learning about the soils with uh, web soil survey for different areas is a great, great resource. Um, and you can go on web soil. There are some um, um, videos that explain how you can work through web soil survey, and it will tell you all the information that you need to know. But for a basic um, soil book, um, this is from my undergrad, so it's old, <laughs> but it's one of the best. Um, it's by Brady, the national, national, the natural and processes of soil. I don't know if you can see it. No, you can't. I can't see it. There. <laughs> so it's reversed, but um, it looks like this. There's actually another version of sticker. This is a really, really, really great resource. Um, there's also a, um, a really, it's not general, but it's a really good resource on understanding how soils form. And that is the soil genesis. Oh, why? This one won't even show. OK, so it's the soils and the geomorphology. And um, I'm going to butcher the last name. But I can put these in the chat if, if that helps. Um, but the last name is um, Anderson and Schetzel uh, is the authors. But uh, this. This explains so many things. I still, this is from my graduate work, and um, I still refer to it. Obviously, I had them on the, my desk. <laughs> so it is a really good resource. Um, another, uh, for the Willamette Valley, if you, even just Google um, the Willamette Valley um, soils. Oh, this is the wrong one. Well, you could probably find this one. I found this online. But um, the proceedings of the Eighth International Soil Management Workshop, utilizing utilization of soil survey information for sustainable land use. And this is a document <clears throat> that was produced in 1993, but it really goes through all the different um, uh, geomorphic and stratigraphy and the soil interpretations of the Lama Valley. Um, see, that's what I have off the top of my head, but um, I can email more resources if that would help and you can email it out. That'd be fantastic, Katie. Okay. And I do have another question or kind of trickling in. John asks, how are these soil series names uh, named like Alspog oh. and Casadero? Is it named for, the loca for a location? Obviously, quite a few of these soils sound like they're named for locations. Yes. Um, typically, so typically they are strictly named by a location of where they are what we call typified. So where we'll find a, a soil that is the most um, typical of that series. So, you know, gray, uh, soils is, is, a, is a distinct science, but at the same time, it's also an art. <laughs> and soils change so quickly uh, within the landscape or can change so quickly in the landscape so the typical head on may not be look exactly the same as that soil in another location. So the soil, sorry, I'm getting in a long answer here, but soils are named by where all the properties for that series is very typical. But they can also, so, when I was mapping in the Klamath Basin, oh, I got to the point where um, all the lands 
landscapes and geographic locations that I could name a soil. Also, soils um, series names have to be um, two letters different from another soil. So, oh. so you can tell the difference between the two. Uh, so I ran under the problem where there wasn't any landscape um, or geographic location names that I could use because there's already soils that are named that way. So I named one um, mouse tails because it was under dug fur. And how you tell the difference between dug fur cones is it's got little mouse tails. <laughs> so you'll find situations like that depending on the soil scientist. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. All right. Um, if we don't have any other questions, um, then um, we can wrap up for the evening. I want to give a big shout out to Katie. Thank you so much. That was very informative. And I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the block diagram. Oh. That is such a cool way to show, um, you know, what you're trying to convey with all the complexities of soils. So that's really great. Thank you. Um, our next session will be May 18th. Uh, Mike Bondi from OSU Extension will be presenting about agriculture. So following up from the geology to the soils, we'll move on to agriculture. And then um, after that, I think we're moving into uh, geomorphology of the basin. So there'll be two geomorphology sessions in June. Um, you can use the same Zoom link. Um, and you're already registered for the event. Uh, we always send an email, a reminder email the day before. And um, following this, we'll send you um, a thank you email with a link to the recording of this presentation. And that might be a good opportunity to also send those reference uh, material okay. titles, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can always find information about this conference series on Clackamas River Basin Council's website. Um, and we'll be sending you information about continuing education credits if you're interested. Um, so thank you to our gold sponsor, Clackamas Water Environment Services, bronze sponsor, Clackamas River Water Providers, and the Geological Society of the Oregon Country, who are helping us keep this conference free for everyone. Um, please consider supporting. And yeah, thank you for joining us. And we'll see you again on May 18th. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Good seeing everyone.